They were like characters out of a movie, a brilliant creative leader, a crew working in perfect precision. They pulled off hundreds of robberies, stole millions, and baffled law enforcement for years. They did their homework. They knew what they were targeting. And they made daring escapes in a custom BMW loaded with gadgets and gizmos. It was like something out of the Goldfinger movie, where Q had rigged up a car for James Bond. Like 007 himself, the gang seemed to have it all. Brains, bravery, bravado. It seemed no one could stop the James Bond gang. Most New Yorkers moved to the suburbs to get away from crime. But in the early 1990s, the city's wealthiest bedroom communities were under attack. Deadbolts and burglar alarms couldn't stop this clever gang of thieves from plundering millions in cash and jewels. They'd pulled off hundreds of jobs with no end in sight. In Bergen County, New Jersey, Everyone knew about the rash of burglaries. Mary Ann Heaver just never thought it would happen to her. She came home one afternoon to find police responding to her burglar alarm. I saw these police officers all around my house with guns drawn, and my front door was open. If the burglars were still in the house, all hell could break loose at any second. I didn't know what to expect. I was very frightened. It was such a shock. Had she come home any earlier, Mary Ann may have come face to face with the intruders. The sergeant said to me, you would have walked in on it, and the consequences could have been very different. But the crooks had already fled. Desperate for a lead, police brought in the canine unit. The dog ran to this big fir tree in front of my house and was barking up at the tree. So it was very obvious to me anyway that whoever was doing this probably hid in the shade of the tree, watched my house. Marianne's sense of violation grew as she walked through her home with police. We went through the whole house. The first thing I noticed were everything was pulled out, drawers, and including a drawer that had my jewelry in it. Everything had been cleaned out. $4,000 of jewelry, gold rings, silver bracelets, and a pearl necklace, all gone. And they hadn't left a single clue. The burglaries were so widespread, investigators had a hard time believing a single gang could be responsible. They were operating, you know, one day in Bergen County, the next day in Morris County, then going down to Monmouth County, and then going to New York and then Connecticut. There are a lot of different burglaries that occur. So if you were a detective and you were looking at a, at a bunch of them, you may not see a pattern. You may just see a whole string of burglaries. But then a police patrol car spots a BMW speeding away from where a burglary had just taken place. The cops gave chase, but got more than they bargained for. All of a sudden, the back license plate flipped down, and a cluster of halogen lights popped out and blinded the police, and then the car took off. Police were left in the dust. With their mysterious getaway car and stylish M.O., the thieves became known to the police and media as the James Bond gang. And that was the first time it began to connect that I think I was robbed by the James Bond gang. Fear and fascination swirled around this unstoppable gang until cops could get a lead on these elusive burglars and the mastermind at their helm. The James Bond gang couldn't be shaken or stirred. <laughs> A well-organized gang of burglars was plundering New York City's wealthiest suburbs, stealing millions in cash and jewels. 
The police and FBI seemed powerless to stop them. We knew that they were good because most of the detectives were good detectives, and they pretty much knew who was committing the burglaries, but they just weren't able to apprehend them. Their high-tech getaway car always kept them one step ahead of the law. Sophisticated and clever, the gang had an air of international mystery. But these criminals were homegrown. Terence Lawton was the ringleader. His associates were Bruce Anderson, known as Cap. David Kirkland, better known as Keith. And Walter Smith, AKA Demo. They'd all grown up together. These were basically a bunch of kids that got together in high school and were schooled by other burglars and they found out they could make a lot of money and, and a living this way. By the time they left school, they were already a disciplined gang of thieves. These guys were smart enough. Most of them did not take drugs. They didn't trust their own friends if they took drugs. Lawton, the leader, had a legitimate business customizing cars. But planning crimes was his passion. He was very good at what he did. He thought about it. He was very calculative. He was a professional in his own way. It was Lawton who designed and built the James Bond car. Terrence Lawton had a detailing shop, and in his shop, he was able to do a lot of things. You can take a car and restore it. You can do a lot of work with it to make it look shiny and new. You can also rig it with a lot of different devices and gizmos, and that's exactly what they did. Lawton transformed a BMW 740 into the perfect getaway car. It was like something out of the Goldfinger movie, where Q had rigged up a car for James Bond in order to uh, help him get away from people who were coming after him. There were buttons on the console. Uh, you would press one button, and a, a drawer, secret compartment, would slide out from underneath the dashboard. And they'd be able to throw the cash and the jewelry in, press the button again, and the drawer would then go back underneath the dashboard. If police ever pulled the gang over, the loot would be safely hidden away but they didn't intend to get caught in the first place. The license plate would be electronically uh, operated and be four bright halogen light bulbs that would go on, and that would be to blind law enforcement when they were chasing them so they couldn't get close enough to get the license plate number. It was a very sophisticated idea. The one thing that made them different was the car. It made perfect sense in terms of what they were doing. They were just as clever when it came to planning their burglaries. They realized that early on that the, the places to hit were the, the ritzy neighborhoods, the exclusive neighborhoods. And that's what they concentrated on. Neighborhoods where BMWs were a dime a dozen and wouldn't look out of place. They were able to case some of these neighborhoods without raising any kind of suspicion. Just cruising up and down streets designating certain houses, finding certain certain places that they wanted to hit. They did their homework. They knew the areas they were going into. They knew what they were targeting. They would look at the, the landscape and to see that people spent a lot of money on the landscaping. To the James Bond gang, burglary was a craft they wanted to perfect. They got better each time. They learned about reinforced doors, but they always knew how to attack and knew how to beat the system. They didn't know when to stop. They were addicted to it. They would actually, it would almost get elated, almost like a high when they were talking about the burglaries because they enjoyed it so much of what they were doing. In December 1992, the gang targeted Mary Ann Heaver's house in Bergen County, New Jersey. They knew exactly what they were looking for. They knew exactly the type of homes they were looking for. Um, and it would seem to me that they they knew exactly the type and methodology of the alarm systems. Once they picked their target, they moved in with military precision. First, an advance man hid by a tree and scouted out the house. 
When he was sure the house was empty, he called in the others. Lawton was the driver. He'd wait in the car while the rest of the gang went in. They always went through the front door. They would actually ring the bell before they went in and make sure no one was home. The Heaver's alarm was on. But the gang was unfazed. Sometimes they would rip out the alarms. By the time the alarm company calls the police, they're already in the car and gone. They knew that they had a time limit to get in and get out. One of the members of the gang looks out for homeowners returning or for the police. One other member of the gang will go up and immediately begin to ransack the bedrooms in search of uh, jewelry, cash, uh, a safe. Most people hide things in their bedrooms. They feel safe, but that's usually that's the place they would target. Outside, Lawton monitored police radios, ready to alert the gang if cops were on their way. The gang always knew the quickest, safest way out. Once they recover what they're looking for, they will immediately open the uh, back door or rear sliding glass door so that they have an easy uh, exit route. They then made their way to where Lawton was waiting to pick them up. They're very surgical, they're very precise, and they're usually in and out of the house inside of the minutes. By the time the police responded to the alarm, the gang and the loot would be long gone. They always called a burglary a payday. And they knew that when they ran out of money, they could just go out to another burglary that day, that afternoon. If they were chased, Terrence Lawton had several tricks up his sleeve. If the blinding lights didn't stop pursuers in their tracks, there was plan B. At the press of a button, oil would spew out the back of the car. No one could catch them if they were sliding all over the road. The gang had perfected the art of burglary. Like James Bond himself, they seemed unstoppable. But even 007 had his weaknesses. And sooner or later, police knew the notorious gang was bound to make a mistake. By the mid-1990s, the James Bond gang was notorious. Terrence Lawton and his associates had pulled off over 500 burglaries for millions of dollars. Their egos had grown almost as fat as their wallets. They would brag in the local bars or restaurants about who they were. They actually would take some of the jewelry that they stole and they would have it reset, sometimes in their name or into different things for their girlfriends. They would brag about it, where it came from. While the gang was getting sloppy, the cops were getting their act together. Local police do burglaries, and they tend to be investigated in the individual towns by the individual police departments. In this case, there had been so many of them. They had been so similar that local police were starting to talk to each other. The police called in Bob Bukowski of the FBI. They were a challenge. Local law enforcement was having trouble, and he reached out to us, but it became a team effort because we weren't going to do it alone either. Informants fingered Lawton, Anderson, Kirkland, and Smith as the James Bond gang. The FBI put the gang members under surveillance, but the suspects were expert at avoiding police. Any attempt at traditional surveillance always failed because they were just extremely aware. So they go to incredible lengths to uh, make sure they're not being followed. We call it to clean themselves before they go and do an, a burglary. They'll spend hours uh, jumping on buses, going on subways. Uh, they get into their own cars and will drive around for extended periods of time. Sometimes, on occasion, one of them may be caught coming out of a house, but you can only charge them with that one individual burglary. 
They knew that they were going to get bail. It was a nonviolent crime. The James Bond gang was too clever to end up in jail. The FBI would have to come up with another way of outwitting them. So instead of going after the crooks, they decided to go after the loot. We found out that they were fencing, no matter where the burglaries took place, no matter what state, they were always fencing the, uh, the stolen jewelry. It was fairly easy for them to get rid of the jewelry. Um, you just across the Hudson River in Manhattan in the Diamond District, you can find plenty of people who would be more than happy to take it off their hands and pay 20 cents on the dollar. It's a very, very lucrative business for the middlemen. For jewelry fences, the James Bond gang was a dream come true. They became such good customers that the main uh, jeweler, Ron Lerman, had a separate apartment where he was available to them basically 24 hours a day, that they would get paid instantly for their, uh, their burglary they did. If one of them was caught, the fence would put up their bail just to keep them working. When we arrested the fence, Ron Lerman, we did a search warrant and we come up with a half a million dollars worth of jewelry in his possession. Some of the burglary victims were able to identify their jewels among Lerman's stash. The FBI finally had the information they needed to bust the gang. The James Bond gang was moving the jewelry across state lines, which put them in violation of the RICO statutes. The RICO statutes are federal laws designed to crack down on organized crime. Fencing jewels over state lines violated these laws. So did the gang's customized car. They were taking measures to conceal their criminal acts. The car, the sliding compartments, the scanners, everything else. That violates the RICO statutes. The federal laws, the federal penalties are much harsher than the local penalties. After two years of frustration, the FBI and police finally had enough evidence to put the James Bond gang away for a long time. In 1996, Anderson, Kirkland, and Smith were arrested. But criminal mastermind Terrence Lawton was nowhere to be found. The FBI came up with an ingenious plan to catch him. The FBI had three members of the James Bond gang in custody, but mastermind Terrence Lawton was still at large. The FBI knew Lawton had a legitimate business, so they came up with a simple but clever sting operation. They were having trouble finding Lawton. So what they did was they called him on a cell phone. And they told him that the business where he had actually been doing the work, customizing the car, creating the James Bond car, had been burglarized. Would Lawton believe the story? Would he come out of hiding and risk an encounter with police? All the FBI could do was wait and hope. At first, nothing. Then Lawton drove up in the James Bond car. He expected to see the police. He didn't expect to be arrested. That was when they started to, to see what they had. And that was in the form of this BMW that had been rigged in order to, to commit their crimes. Once they seized the vehicle, they were able to, to find other gizmos. The James Bond car was the critical piece of evidence for the FBI. They were able to make a case against them. The FBI also discovered the gang's loot. And we recovered over a half a million dollars worth of uh, jewelry and cash. I'm happy that uh, they caught them. It's terrible to know 
that somebody can so easily enter your home. I hope very much that they got the maximum penalty for what they did. The James Bond gang members each faced up to 20 years in prison, but they pleaded guilty and got reduced sentences of between three and six years. Still, the FBI was happy to have them off the streets, at least for the time being. Sarah Slaughton never spent a day in jail until he was caught by, uh, by this indictment. It was the first time he actually went to jail. The James Bond gang was gone, but not forgotten. With clever planning, brilliant execution, and unforgettable getaways, they left a lasting impression on their adversaries. Our feeling towards them personally was just that they were very smart, that they were very disciplined, and sort of a begrudging respect for their capabilities as, as home burglars. If I were to describe Lawton and his crew, they were clever, but not clever enough. Now, high-tech detectives take on a real-life mystery. What deep, dark secrets will they uncover? Follow the clues on Forensic Files. Coming up right now, here on Court TV.